What about caffeine? Caffeine and then creatine that will follow this are really two of the only supplements that consistently work. Caffeine gets into your blood quickly. This shows that within 60 minutes, it's already at around peak levels. But this has since been shown to be true for 30 minutes. You can take this 30 minutes before exercise and you'll start to see effects of caffeine within 15 minutes. As soon as it gets into your blood, it seems to start exerting effects. Now, it's not a nutrient, so it's not used for energy provision itself, but it directly crosses the blood-brain barrier and it can affect the brain itself. Um, it lasts for a long time, so half-life is four to five hours, which means that over the course of the day, you can still see residual caffeine in your body from your morning coffee. Um, and at low doses, it seems to have a performance effect. There's no additional increase in time to exhaustion when you move from three milligrams per kilogram up to six or up to nine. And in fact, at nine, kilo, or nine milligrams per, per kilogram, you start to see what looks like a decrease in performance because nine milligrams per kilogram is a lot of caffeine. For a 70 kilogram individual, that's 630 milligrams, which might be five to six cups of coffee, which is just a little too much to take in before trying to do uh, some competitive exercise. So effects at low doses, gets into your blood quickly. And not only does it have effects at the start of exercise, but you can take caffeine later on during exercise and still see an improvement in performance. And that's what this study is showing us here. So subjects in this study exercised for two hours with normal sports drink, and then at the end of that two hours, were broken up into four different groups. So there was a control group, which just got a sports drink. There was a cola group, which got increased carbohydrate and caffeine and then the individual components so just the increased carbohydrate or just the caffeine and what we see is that caffeine is responsible for about 70 percent of the improved performance in a time trial after that two hours of exercise so this this is data from um, a work-based time trial complete this amount of work as quickly as possible. In the control group, it took about 27 minutes, and that was decreased in the caffeine group and in the carbohydrate group. And those effects seem to be additive, but most of the effect came from the caffeine itself and not the carbohydrate. Um, this is likely to be central because later on in exercise, there's not gonna be too much uh, stimulatory effect on adipose tissue of caffeine especially when you're doing a time trial at higher intensity, blood's really being diverted away from adipose tissue, really supplying the muscles, really circulating back to the lungs and the brain, and so there isn't gonna be much of an effect of increasing free fatty acids in the plasma. So it's thought that a lot of this effect is due to direct caffeine stimulation of the brain. This incidentally is um, a factorial analysis that's really similar to the one that we saw in the BELO paper with fluid and carbohydrate intake. It just shows the independent and combined effects of two different factors. So here we have caffeine and carbohydrate. In the BELO paper, we had fluid and carbohydrate. Incidentally, both cases seem to be additive. So in conclusion, Caffeine works at low and moderate doses. It's ergogenic. We didn't talk about all the different situations where it does improve performance, but there are a lot of them. Um, as long as it seems to be beyond about four minutes, not really acute or um, progressive VO2 max testing, for example. Um, there's a lot of lab-based and field-based research that supports the uh, effects of caffeine, and there's minimal side effects. The only side effects that you'll really get is if you ingest too much caffeine. So it's almost self-regulating, which might be a really good thing. Um, although the mechanism remains somewhat elusive, we're fairly confident it's direct effects on the central nervous system. And there's really no known negative effects of caffeine other than being really jittery when you take too much. So 
lots of good evidence supporting the use of caffeine in, uh, in exercise and in competition. Like anything, you have to try it with training first to make sure that um, the level that you're using is appropriate and that you see improvements in performance. What about creatine? Creatine, another one of those supplements that does work. Uh, could supplementing with creatine, number one, increase phosphocreatine in the muscle or total creatine in the muscle? Does that extra creatine give us the ability to buffer ATP a little bit better? So is there an increase in energy provision? Does that increased energy provision improve sprint performance? Is there a functional effect of increasing the creatine pool? If there is a functional effect, does that allow us to increase muscle mass? If we can work out at higher intensity during resistance exercise, um, will that improve muscle mass? Or is there some other effect of creatine in the muscle as well? Now, creatine gets into the blood right away, within an hour, and we see this massive spike from around 20 to 40 micromolar to 600 or 1,000 micromolar. So really big increases in plasma creatine that last for a long time. And this idea is used with loading creatine. So every four or five hours, take another five gram dose and you can build off the residual creatine in the plasma and elevate that spike a little bit more. Now, what's different about creatine versus um, taurine that we saw in the last study is that creatine gets into the muscle. Taurine didn't get into the muscle, but creatine is able to overload the transporters at the cell membrane and over um, a loading phase of six days increases total creatine content. And you can see that consistently in both of these figures here. So total creatine is increased. If you break that up and measure phosphocreatine and then just normal creatine, you see increases in both of those as well. So we have the potential for increased sprint performance and the potential for increased um, resistance exercise performance. Now what you'll notice here on the top graph is that if you just load the muscle with creatine and then stop doing anything, creatine levels progressively decrease over the course of seven weeks or five weeks. If you add a maintenance dose, what's called a maintenance dose, that's just two grams of creatine per day, there's no decrease in creatine over those five weeks, which is really important. You only need two grams. You don't have to have four or five grams a day. Um, any extra creatine simply gets wasted. So just two grams a day after loading maintains muscle creatine content. Now, this figure, these two figures show a pretty consistent increase in muscle creatine content uh, with loading, but it's really individualized. It's different for every person. It seems to be because there's this upper limit to the amount of creatine the muscle can hold on to. So if you start with a low creatine content, supplementation will increase total creatine a lot. If you start with a high creatine content in the muscle already, if you're just genetically predisposed to have high creatine, then supplementation won't really do much. It might try to increase it, but we start to see some, some rebounding where the muscle loses or expels creatine for some reason. There seems to be an upper limit around 150 millimoles per kilogram dry mass. Now, is there a functional benefit of creatine? Absolutely. You see here the maximum work performed and the total work performed during two Wingate tests. Wingate tests done back to back. So before creatine supplementation and then after creatine supplementation, you can see a difference in the ability of these subjects to perform maximal work and total work. Although total work is really the only one that's significantly higher. So we see an increase in total work if we, if we suggest, if we argue that maximum work is not different, that must mean that there is a decreased decay in work performed over the course of that Wingate test. So if total work is higher, but maximum work is the same, that must mean that work output during the Wingate test is better maintained after creatine supplementation. 
So it's really cool. We see an increase in sprint performance. We also see an increase in lean mass gains and strength performance. So here we're, we're showing again loading with creatine. This is after um, six days in women. You can see creatine on the top in the black and then the open squares at the bottom are placebo. Phosphocreatine in the muscle increases. And what's really neat about this data is that for some reason, resistance training while you are on the maintenance dose increases muscle creatine content more than just taking the maintenance dose. So contraction somehow brings more creatine into the muscle and you can see that over the first 10 weeks. After 10 weeks when you stop training and are just doing the maintenance dose, the low dose, creatine content in the muscle decreases and then stabilizes. So training itself has some extra stimulatory effect on taking up creatine. Now this is all well and good, but what we really want to see is whether or not there's an effect on lean mass or strength. There is in fact an increase in fat-free mass, which we take to be muscle mass in the creatine group versus the placebo group. Now, both groups increase fat-free mass just because of the training that was happening during the first 10 weeks. But the creatine group saw greater increases, greater lean mass gains than the placebo group. And what's also interesting is even though we stopped training, and these women stopped training after 10 weeks, the lean mass gains persisted in both groups. So the low dose seems to hold on to, allow you to hold on to whatever muscle mass gains that you had, even if you stop training. Um, no idea how long that will last for. You certainly can't just do one massive resistance training program over one month and then hold on to those mass gains forever. Um, but really neat on the, on the short term. So greater increase in muscle mass with the creatine group and with training. And so overall, if we wrap up the idea of ergogenic aids, <clears throat> most of them are not going to work. You have to think about it in a whole body context and then look to see if there's effects, whole body effects, either on fat oxidation or performance or RPE, and that will warrant you going to look a little bit deeper into the muscle or into the blood at what the mechanisms could be. So we want to see if there's whole body effects. The reality is that not many supplements do work. It's possible that we'll find ways uh, to get supplements to work. We'll find other supplements, but those will require rigorous testing as well. And so it has to be a cost-benefit analysis on whether or not you want to take these supplements or have your clients take these supplements with training. How much does it cost? How long do you have to supplement with them? Are there any detrimental health effects? Does performance increase initially and then decrease? Or does it even help performance? Is there any danger of these things putting you on um, like an IOC ban list or increasing the illegal drugs in your system somehow? On the other hand, does, does it improve performance? Can you supplement acutely? Um, are other people doing it, which is sad to say, but a lot of people now need to supplement in order to stay competitive in a lot of sports. Does it help improve health? There's all kinds of different factors that go into whether or not you want to supplement with um, any ergogenic aid, but have to be inherently skeptical, as a lot of them, like I said, really don't work. They don't have the ability to change the physiological systems in the body.